This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and will be a little bit more about Hensel's lemma, or Newton's method, and a little bit about periodic numbers. So I'll just recall what we were talking about um, concerning Hensel's lemma in the previous lecture. So the idea was we wanted to solve f of x is congruent to zero mod p to the n for some n. And you remember, if we had a solution, um, f of x1 is congruent to 0 mod um, p to the n, we can try and find the solution um, mod p to the n plus 1. And we remember, if we put x2 um, is equal to x1 minus f, prime, f of x1 over f prime of x1, then um, this will be a better um, solution provided f prime of x1 is not congruent to 0 modulo p. And the problem I'm going to discuss now is what happens if um, this condition here is not satisfied. So what if, if f prime of x1 is congruent to 0 mod p? So, uh, uh, as an explicit example of this, we might look at x squared um, is congruent to, um, say, um, 17 mod 2 to the n. And here our polynomial is f of x equals x squared minus 17, and f prime of x is equal to 2x. And we notice that this is going to be congruent to 0 modulo 2. So, it looks as if we can't use Newton's method or Hensel's lemma to solve this. However, we can if, if we are a little bit more careful. Um, so, suppose we have a solution um, um, x1 with f of x um, is, is congruent to 0 mod e to the something or other, and suppose f prime of x1 is not congruent to sorry is congruent to zero modulo p. Then um, we have f of x f f prime of x one might be divisible by some number p to the d, but not by p to the d plus one for some d. So we're taking the highest power of p that divides the derivative. So d is d equals zero is the case we have already done where f prime of x is is not divisible by p. Now if we look at um, f of x minus f of x over f prime of x, so you remember this is the this this is the improved solution using Newton's method. Well, we can write this out as f of x sorry f of x plus f prime of x times minus f of x over f prime of x. So here we're, we're writing out the first few terms of the Taylor series expansion of this. So then we have the um, um, uh, um, second derivative of f over 2 factorial times minus f of x over f prime of x all squared plus higher terms. And as in Newton's method, um, these two cancel out. So the first two terms are zero. And um, suppose um, f of x is congruent to zero mod p to the n for some n, then we want this to, th th then this will be um, divisible by by um, p to the 2n divided by um, p to the 2d. And so we want this to be um, divisible by at least p to the n plus 1. So, so we want to get an improvement. So we need 2n minus 2d has to be greater than or equal to n plus 1. So we find n is greater than or equal to 2d plus 1. So, so this shows 
when we can use um, Newton's method in, in, in these more special cases. So, so summary, suppose um, f of x is congruent to 0 mod p to the n, and f prime of x is divisible by p to the d, not by p to the d plus 1. And suppose n is greater than or equal to 2d plus 1. Then, let's call this f of x1. Then f of x2 will be congruent to 0 mod p to the n plus 1 where x2 is given by uh, the Newton's method, x2 is equal to x1 minus f of x1 over f prime of x1. Notice that if d is equal to 0, this is the previous case we had, we, we want f prime of x1 is not divisible um, by p, which is p to the 0 plus 1, and we want f of x1 is congruent to 0 mod p to the 1 or p to the n and the condition is that just n is greater than or equal to 1 so so in, the, in this case 2d plus 1 is just equal to 1. So the previous case of Newton's method is a, is a special case of this more general method. So so let's apply this to the old problem of um, um, when can we solve um, x squared is congruent to a mod 2 to the n for n large. And we're going to take a to be odd. And what we here we um, we look at the, 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 the polynomial f of x is equal to 2x minus a. So f prime of x is equal to 2. So this is divisible by 2 to the 1, not by 2 squared. So we take d equals 1 and we find the condition n has to be greater than or equal to 2d plus 1 which is equal to 3. So if um, x squared is congruent to a modulo 2 cubed, okay, we're taking a to be some odd number, then we can solve, th 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 then we can lift to x squared is congruent to a modulo 2 to the 4, 2 to the 5, and so on. Of course, um, Newton's method won't be increasing the exponent by 1 each step. It will increase the exponent by 1, then by 2, then by 4, and so on, because it, it gets faster as you, as you go on. Um, well, so, so we ask, when can we solve um, x squared is congruent to a modulo 2 cubed. Well, that's easy enough. We just check all possible cases. Um, let's suppose x is equal to 1, 3, 5, or 7 mod 8, because we're only looking at odd numbers. Then x squared is going to be congruent to 1, 1, 1, or 1 mod 8. So um, for a odd as usual, we can solve um, x squared is congruent to a mod 2 to the n for n large if and only if a is congruent to 1 modulo 8. Um, so we can contrast this with what happens if, if we're trying to solve x squared is congruent to a modulo p. Again, we take p does not divide a. Um, in this case, f of x is just 2x and we notice that if um, x is not congruent to 0 mod p, then um, this is not divisible by p because p is odd, so this factor of 2 doesn't matter. So we can take d equals 1, and provided um, if, if we solve x squared is congruent to a mod p to the n, then we can solve x squared is congruent to a mod p to the n plus 1, provided n is greater than or equal to 1. So this 1 is, is our number 2d plus 1. So, um, for example, if we take p equals 5, we can solve x squared is common to a mod p 
if and only if a is congruent to 0, 1, or 4 mod 5. So we can solve x squared is congruent to 0. So x squared is congruent to a mod 5 to the n for n large. If and only if a is congruent to 0, or so if a is congruent to 1 or 4, mod 5. This is, this is for the case 5 does not divide a. If 5 does divide a, we've got to be a little bit more careful. Um, so if we want to solve, say, x squared is congruent to 5 to the um, m times a for a odd, for a not divisible by 5, modulo 5 to the n. Well, obviously what we can do is, if m is even, um, we can just solve, we, we can just say x is equal to 5 to the m over 2 times the square root of a. And then we reduce to the case when a is not divisible by 5. And if m is odd and n is uh, sufficiently large, you see this doesn't have a solution. Um, so this gives a more or less complete solution to when we can solve um, x squared is congruent to a modulo p to the n. You can reduce it to the case when x squared is congruent to a modulo p to the power of 1, unless p is 2, in which case, um, as we saw, we need to check x squared is congruent to a modulo p cubed. So um, a summary of this is that using Hensel's lemma or Newton's method, we can pretty much reduce the solution of congruences modulo a prime power to um, solutions modulo a prime. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about p-adic numbers, which are a sort of way of putting this together. So you remember in the previous lecture, we were solving the equation um, um, x squared is congruent to 7 modulo 3 to the 100. And we remember we've got this series of solutions, so, so x is congruent to 1, mod 3, or x is congruent to um, 1 times 3 plus 1 mod 3 squared, or x is congruent to 1 times 3 squared times 1 plus 1 times 3 plus 1 mod 3 cubed, or x is congruent to 1 times 3 squared plus 1 times 3 plus 1 modulo 3 to the 4, and so on. And we can think of these numbers as being written out in base 3. So if I write them in base 3, these become x equals x is congruent to 1, or x is congruent to 1, 1, or x is congruent to 1, 1, 1, or x is congruent to 0, 1, 1, 1. And if we go on, we, we, we can find x is congruent to something like 1, 1, 2, 0, 0, 2, 0, 1, 1, 1, mod 3 to the whatever it is. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, that would be mod 3 to the 10. And we can do this for any modulo 3 to the power of any finite number. And then you get the idea, why not just continue it forever? So we can say that um, a, a p-adic number, let, let, let's be a bit informal, is just a number in base p that goes off to the left an infinite distance. Um, now, going off an infinite distance isn't so strange. Um, let, let, let's look at a real number like like um, um, uh, like pi, for example. Well, well, pi is equal to three point one four one five nine two six five three five, and so on. And this goes on for an infinite distance to the right. And you remember, this is just short for saying pi is equal to 3 times 10 to the 1 plus 1 times 10 to the minus 1 plus 4 times 10 to the minus 2 plus 1 times 10 to the minus 3 and so on. And, and we just continue this series forever. And similarly, the p-adic number 1120020111, um, which goes off to an infinite number to the left, can be thought of as a shorthand form for um, 
1 times 3 to the 0 plus 1 times 3 to the 1 plus 1 times 3 squared plus 0 times 3 cubed plus 2 times 3 to the 4 and so on. So um, here we have an infinite series of powers of 10, which is just a real number. Here we have an infinite series of powers of 3, and this is going to be a 3 addict number. And you may be a bit nervous about this, because if you look at this series here, um, <laughs> you... You, you, th you think, well, this series doesn't converge. Um, you know, you have all these tests for convergence in real analysis, and these terms don't even go to zero, so this does not converge. Well, it's true, it does not converge to a real number. The, 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 there's no real number like this. However, it does converge to a p-adic number. We've got a perfectly good p-adic number that goes off an infinite distance to the left. And it turns out that for p-adic numbers, um, high powers of 3 actually, in some sense, get smaller and smaller. I mean, if, if you think of a high power of 3 as being a real number, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But if, if it's a p-adic number, it's actually getting smaller and smaller and smaller because a high power of 3 has a lot of zeros here followed by a 1. And the more zeros there are here, the, the smaller the p-adic number is. So, so it's quite different from real numbers. And with real numbers, if you have lots of zeros before the decimal point, it's, it's becoming a big real number. But for a p-adic number, it's becoming smaller. And it's the other way around for numbers to the right of the decimal point. So um, powers 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3 becoming very small real numbers. But they're, they're actually rather big as p-adic numbers because... Piadic numbers you get smaller as you go off to the left, whereas real ones you get smaller as you go off to the right. Um, so what can we do with these funny piadic numbers? Well, um, we can add and multiply piadic numbers. And we can add and multiply them using the usual rules. So if we've got a p-adic number, say, ending in 2, 1, uh, so, so, so let's do three-adic numbers. So we're working base 3. And if we've got another p-adic number, um, 1, 1, something or other, then we can just add them up using the usual rules for addition. So we add 1 and 1, and we get 2. Then we add 2 and 1, which is 3. Um, so we get 0, and then we carry 1, and then we add up these numbers here. Maybe there's a 0 and a 1, so... Um, we add 0 and 1 and add the carry and we get 2 and we can go on like this and it's sort of fairly obvious that um, we can go on forever and we get a perfectly good p-adic number and we can multiply them in much the same way so um, if we wanted to multiply these we would multiply 1 by 1 and get 1 and then we would cross multiply 2 times 1 plus 1 times 2 is 3 so we get 0 and we carry 1 then we have 0 times 1 plus 2 times 2 plus 1 times 1, which is 3, and we add the carry, which is 1, and we get 1, and so on. So, so we can just you know, multiply them and add them in just the usual way. Um, what about subtraction? Well, you might think we can't subtract p-adic numbers. You remember for real numbers, we, we, if we want to subtract 2 from 1, we need to put a minus sign in front. And I, I never got round to putting minus signs in front of real numbers. However, we can also subtract p-adics, p-adic numbers. So what about 0 minus 1? And... Let, let, let's work with 10 adic numbers rather than p adic numbers. So what I want to do is I want to take the number 0, and I'm going to write this in base 10, and I want to subtract the number 1. Well, let's see what we get. Well, we have 0 minus 1 we can't do, so we have to borrow 1 from here, and we get 10 minus 1, which is 9. Well, um, then we've borrowed 1 from here, so we only get a 9 here. And then we have to borrow one from here, so we, we get another nine, and it goes on like this. And we just get nines going all the way to the right. And this is actually equal to minus one as a ten adic number. And you can you can kind of check this by adding one to this, and one plus nine is zero, carry one, one plus nine is zero, carry one, one plus nine is zero, carry one, and so on. So we do actually have negative p adic or ten adic numbers. They, they, they just go off to the left infinitely often. So p numbers, 
we can do addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Um, we can't always do division, um, although um, um, we, we can do division by anything that's not divisible by p. So um, if we want to solve um, ax is congruent, is, is congruent to 1 mod p to the n, we can solve if a is not congruent to 0 mod p. And what this means is that a has an inverse in the p addicts if p does not divide a. So we almost have division. I mean, you, you, if, if we're working with the p addict numbers, we, we can't divide by p, but we can divide by anything not divisible by p. Um, and we can ask questions like which numbers are squares? So over the reals, the numbers are squares if a is greater than or equal to z if a is greater than or equal to zero, obviously. Um, what about the two addicts? So we've got a two addict number which um, um, has an um, if we write it in base two, it goes off infinitely far to the left. Well, we answered this before. If it's odd. And notice that for a two addict number being odd makes sense because you just have to ask whether the last digit is odd or even. Then we saw it's a square if and only if it's 1 mod 8. So that's if and only if it's something or other ending in 0, 0, 1. And more generally, if it's even, what we have to do, so suppose it looks like something or other um, one zero one zero 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 point something. So is this a square? Well, we can cross out pairs of zeros because that's just dividing by um, four, which is a square. And then we look at what's left. And the last three digits that we haven't yet crossed out have to be one mod eight. And this isn't one mod eight. So this is not a square. So we can tell where the numbers are squares in the two addicts. And for the p addicts, we had a very simple answer. So for the for the p addicts, if we've got a number ending in a, um, this is a square. Um, and let's take a. Let's suppose the last digit a is not congruent to zero mod p. And then this is a square if and only if a is a square mod p, because we saw that if it's a square mod p, then we can lift it to a square modulo p squared and modulo p cubed and so on. Um, and now we can see that um, if we compare the reals and say the two addicts and the three addicts, you can see that these are all quite different. For example, um, is minus seven a square? Well, in the reals, it's obviously not. In the two addicts, yes, because minus 7 is congruent to 1 mod 8. Um, what about the, th the, the, the three addicts? Well, here we have um, minus 7 is congruent to 2 mod 3. So no, it's not a square because 2 isn't a square mod 3. So the two addicts are definitely different from the reals, and the two addicts are definitely different from the three addicts because... Um, they, they, they differ in whether minus 7 is a square or not. And of course, you can check the three addicts are different from the reals by finding something that's a square in one but not in the other. Um, so um, as a sort of theme about p-adic numbers is anything you can do for the reals has an analogue for the p-adics. So, for instance, we've seen this with Newton's method. We can do Newton's method to find roots of equations over the real numbers. And we saw early on that we could use Newton's method to find roots of equations over the p-adic numbers in just the same way. And then you can take everything you did in, you know, 1A calculus. You know, you do differentiation or integration 
or you can define funny functions like exponential functions or logarithms or sine functions. And you can define analogs of all of these over the p-adics. So, so there's a notion of differentiation and integration for p-adic numbers. And we can define the p-adic exponential function. And you can even do things like p-adic gamma functions and p-adic zeta functions if you're into that. Um, so I'll just give uh, finish by giving an example of this. Um, over the reals, we can sometimes solve equations f of x equals x by iterating. By iteration. So, for instance, if you want to solve cosine x equals x, what you do is you pick some random number x0 and enter it into your pocket calculator. And then you keep on hitting the cosine button. So you take x0, cosine x0 goes to cosine of cosine x naught and so on and if you, if you do this you will see that the number on your pocket calculator is converging to a root of cosine x equals x and we can do this uh, similar thing for the p addicts um, and um, in particular um, you can try and solve the equation x to the p minus one is, con is um, equal to one in the p addict numbers so what this means is we're trying to solve x to the p minus 1 is common to 1 mod p to the n for some very large number of with some very large number n. And you can write this, it's more or less the same as saying x to the p is congruent to x modulo p, um, as long as x is not divisible by p, of course or rather modulo p to the n. And now this is of the form fx equals x with f of x equals x to the p. So we can try and solve this by picking some random number, say 2, and then we take 2 to the p, and then we might take 2 to the p to the p, goes to 2 to the p to the p to the p, and <coughs> this should converge to um, a solution of... Um, x to the p minus 1 equals 1 mod p to the n. So um, let's try it with p equals 5. We map 2 and then 2 goes to 2 to the 5 which is 32 which is congruent to um, so this is 2 mod 5 this is 7 mod 5 squared and then we square 7 which is um, so we don't square 7 we take 7 to the 5 and um, which is congruent to 57 mod 5 cubed and so on and these numbers 2 7 and 57 are now sort of converging to a p-adic square so so a, not a p-adic square p-adic um fourth root of one um um so okay that's uh, i guess that's enough for solutions of equations modulo p to the n um, so the next lecture, I'll be talking about how do you solve um, the equation f of x is congruent to zero modulo p. So, so we've shown how to reduce solutions mod p to the n to finding solutions mod p. So obviously we need to now discuss how to find solutions modulo p to the one.